let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we are nearing the very end of the class. It's nearing the end of the term. Uh, so first, logistics. I sent out an email uh, via Quirkus, uh, Quirkus announcement. So if you haven't already, you should tell me your preferred presentation dates. I will roughly be going in order of when people send me emails. So um, if you want the very last day, hope you probably need to have already sent me an email. So I already got several that I haven't looked through yet. Um, yeah, so uh, tell me what you want as your presentation days. Uh, second, uh, it is important to, uh, so there's going to be one other problem set on some very basic algebraic topology, super basic stuff. Um, and then there's going to be for the problem set number 10, we're going to have you guys do peer review of each other's presentations. Um, these will, you guys' presentations will not be going on YouTube. Um, they will also be live streamed on Zoom, but I strongly encourage you to be here in person um, for the presentations uh, of your classmates. Uh, you'll have, say, 20 minutes with five minutes of questions at the end to talk about what you've been learning. Um, many of your projects, uh, looking at your progress reports, they didn't actually work, but that's perfectly fine because projects often don't work. Uh, but you should talk about what you learned, the, the sort of setup of the problem, and what you're, you were thinking and what you tried. Um, two presentations per day. Yeah, so two presentations per day. So I think we have six presentations. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but. Um, so that'll be the last three days of the last Wednesday, as well as the Friday and Thursday before it. So in terms of lecture for this class, the lectures that I'm going to be giving include today and tomorrow, when we're going to be talking about a little bit of Morse theory. Um, I haven't decided what I'm going to do on Friday or next Wednesday yet. So I might do it on some of my own research. I might do it on something else. If you have particular topics that you want to talk about, uh, you should send me an email and I'll look into seeing if I can prepare a lecture for that. Um, these last couple of lectures, there aren't going to be problem sets for. It's basically just whatever you guys find interesting in the broad realm of massive data analytics. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so given that, what did we do last time? Well, we talked about simplicial complexes and uh, the uh, homo competing homologies of simplicial complexes. And um, you can build a filtration of things like uh, Victoria Streep's complexes, build those up, and you can understand the topology of a point cloud. But now, um, not all data comes, not all things that you want to understand come in the form of a point cloud. Some things come in the form of a function or a manifold or a surface in higher dimensional space. And then you might ask the question of how do we understand lows uh, from a computational topology perspective? And that's where these Morse functions come into play. And it, also they're a discrete analog of piecewise linear Morse functions. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, as a really big caveat, uh, these are not things that I have ever used myself. So for most of this class, it's been on stuff that I know reasonably well. Uh, this is for the Morse theory. I am learning this along with you guys. Like I've seen it before, but like um, you should call me out if I make mistakes because it's quite possible those of you who've done a lot of algebraic topology will know more than I do about this particular topic. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and start by uh, just going back to basics. So first we've been talking about some social complexes. Um, we talk about check complexes. What actually is a complex? And it's a, important because we're gonna be defining a different kind of complex. Uh, and it's gonna have a couple of nice properties. So a complex is a decomposition of a topological space of a topological space into simple pieces, into simple pieces. And the important property is that the common intersection of pieces or the common intersections are lower dimensional pieces of the same type. The same type. So obviously this is true for at least some social complex that we defined, right? Remember one of the really important criteria was that when you intersect uh, two of your simplices in a some social complex, you get some other simplex that is a face of one of your original simplices. Uh, I'll just, let me bring up chat in case anyone asks questions that way. Okay. And so today we're going to build up to uh, the morse smale complex, which is a um, different kind of complex than the simplicial complexes we've seen, though it does the same task of breaking up a big space into a bunch of smaller pieces that we can understand and then chain together. So just wanted to throw that out there. Um, today's lecture is going to be partly from Eidos, Brunner, and Nefer, uh, computational topology, as well as um, from another textbook, uh, a topology for computing uh, by Zoro Modian. So I link both on online. There are PDFs available online. So uh, from I'm mixing together some of those chapters there to try to give you a more intuitive flavor because we're not going to go into the, all of the formalism of Morse theory in this class. Um, 
So hopefully by the end of the, these couple of lectures, you have some sense of what's going on, though you'll need to study further if you're actually going to use it. So uh, let's say that this part is from Edo's Brunner and Herrer. I'm probably making butchering the name. Computational topology, chapter six. Chapter six. Okay, so let's start by just doing it, starting with an evocative example rather than jumping straight into theory. So in our example, uh, suppose we have an upright 2D hollow torx. So um, assume that this is hollow. I mean, it is hollow, so it's not that hard to assume. Uh, and when, let's draw that out. So we have uh, a torus that's upright. And so uh, each of these bits, they're hollow. And so we are going to ignore all the stuff inside. And uh, let's say it's sitting on some 2D plane or sitting on some flat surface. Okay, and let's call this torus uh, M or this manifold M. And it's going to be the upright uh, 2D hollow, uh, which is standard torus. And let's have it be sitting in R3 just because that makes it really easy to look at. Uh, sitting in R3, okay? And now let's think about a function on that surface. So we're going to pick a really easy function uh, just for illustrative purposes. So let's think of the height function. So for each point on this upright torus, you can look to see how high it is off the desk. And that uh, is some function. It maps each point on the manifold to some real value. So let's let f of x uh, be the height uh, of a point x in m. And uh, we'll call this the height function because that's what we're doing. It's a function from M to R is a height function. So in some ways, this is one of the simplest possible non-trivial functions. Like obviously you could have a constant function, but that's not very interesting. And so uh, we're going to be uh, looking at more complicated functions in a little bit, but sort of the idea is that we have some function on the manifold and we want to understand the manifold, the geometry that function endows the manifold with. Um, and so one way of look, uh, looking at what it does to the manifold is looking at level sets. So uh, F inverse of A is a level set, so the pre-image. Um, so for example, that might be, if you take some slice through, that might be the slice that uh, where this plane intersects uh, because we're just looking at the height function. And uh, we can also talk about a sub-level set. I think I meant to put that in a different color. That's all right. A sub-level set. M sub A, which is F inverse of minus infinity through A, uh, which is of course the set of all X in M such that they are lower than that height. Okay, so you can think about that as just cutting off, like just part, cutting off the top part of the torus and just keeping the bottom uh, as you like increase your cuts, of, as A increases. So now the question now is, well, we have some function um, and we can think of this as some uh, function that as you sweep up the parameter, so it's, uh, as you look at the sub-level sets, as you sweep up the parameter, how does the topology of this shape change as you increase that height, that, the height at which you're cutting everything off? And uh, well, one question that we might have is what is the homotopy type or homology, but we're, we're gonna stick with homotopy type for now, of the sub-level set as that increases. So uh, well, let's start with the easiest uh, example. So what happens, uh, let's label each of these points first. Uh, I'm gonna label this point U, so the very bottom point here. Let's label this point B, and let's label this point W, and let's label this point at the top Z. Okay, because somehow those are the points where as you sweep up, like things change, right? So what happens for A is less than F of U? What is uh, the, what does, the sublevel set M sub A look like when A is less than uh, F of U? Yeah, it's empty. So that's super easy. So uh, M sub A is equal to the empty set and has the topology of well, the empty set. Um, but as we go up, stuff happens, right? So what happens for uh, A is greater than F of U and less than F of V? 
So as you go up, so now we've cut off just the, the bottom portion of this. And remember, this is hollow. Yeah, so what you end up with is you end up with a, is a disk. So you cut off just part of it. So it's not quite all of R2 because it's not infinite, obviously. But yeah, so it, it has the shape of a disk. So M sub A is a disk. Uh, and if you cut it off, it looks something like, well, you have this thing. Uh, and this is just the disk. And this is homotopic to just taking a disk and flattening it out, right? So you can think of it, you just sliced off a little bit of this and then you're flattening it out. You can sort of think of this as uh, sort of like the tangent, except you've uh, increased the slightly so it actually cuts through it. That uh, includes that portion. Um, and then as you increase uh, A, uh, more complicated stuff happens. So for A is greater than F of B and less than F of W, then what happens? Now I'm cutting off, say like here. Yeah, so it's a cylinder. So you end up getting uh, the, um, so then M sub A uh, is a cylinder. Uh, and that's because if you were to draw this out, which hopefully I'll be able to do it. If you draw this out, what you end up getting is this thing. But of course uh, you cut, you've cut it open. And so those are, uh, you have open ends. And this is of course still hollow. And this is uh, homotopic to just, well, the cylinder, the hollow cylinder. I think I meant to have that line be dotted. Okay, and another way you can think you can think about this is you can you can construct this by gluing a one handle to the disc. So if you were to take this disc and you take this point and glued it over, uh, then you'd end up with something that's vaguely uh, cylindric like. Um, so that's one way you could be of constructing that. So you can think of uh, constructing these shapes um, as you increase this by gluing something onto it. And that's a standard way of thinking about these sorts of um, changes to the hom uh, homotopy type. Okay, well, as we keep on going, what happens? For F of W is less than A is less than F of Z. Well, then we get that M sub A is a capped torus. So, I mean, this doesn't really look like anything simpler, basically. Uh, you're cutting it off like here-ish, so, or here-ish. So uh, what you end up getting is you end up getting this, this place is open because you cut off the top and it's hollow inside. But like, it is the topology of a cap torus, since that's exactly what it is. And that looks something like uh, this, where you've now capped it off. So that's hollow there. And one way of imagining this is you could, can think of this as gluing a one handle to the cylinder, right? Because if you glue this piece over to this, that's basically what you've ended up doing. And lastly, well, uh, when F of Z is less than A, well, then you get the entire torus. Uh, M sub A is the entire torus. And you can get this by gluing a disc to the capped torus. Okay, so instead of gluing one handle, you have to glue this entire disc to sort of cover it all. Okay, so that's basically what we're going to be trying to do. And so, as you can see, as we sort of sweep the value of the parameter a, of whatever it is, for the site function or some other function, the uh, the topology of the sublevel set changes. And we're trying to understand that. And that's one way of understanding um, a space uh, via some sort of function uh, defined on that space. Okay, so now uh, if you look in the uh, textbook computation topology, it goes into this in sort of broad generality. Um, I'm actually going to take an exposition from this other textbook, which is a little bit more intuitive and doesn't get into as many of the technicalities, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. And so this is going to be from Zomorodian uh, topology for computing. For computing. And this is chapter five of that, which has a simpler, more intuitive uh, in, uh, explanation. Um, so we're going to work in uh, a simpler example. So let's M be a smooth, compact, 2D manifold without a boundary. 
So uh, in other words, so we're going to call this a surface. But like you can think of it as something like this. Um, and we're only going to work in two in well on these 2D manifolds embedded in three space for this, the set of examples, just to give you an illustration, though all these things generalize very nicely to higher dimensions. Um, and we're gonna, oh yeah, let me write that down. Assume for simplicity that our manifold uh, lives in R3. Uh, and this lets us inherit a couple of important things. Um, obviously, one thing is it inherits the topology of R3. Uh, and the other thing that we care about in this particular case is it also inherits the Euclidean metric. Okay, so for a lot of what we're going to be discussing today, it is important that we have some metric on the manifold. And it doesn't have to be the Euclidean metric, but we're going to use that to begin with. Uh, okay, so let's start talking about tangent vectors and spaces, which uh, in this context. So a tangent vector, tangent vector, which you guys have probably mostly heard of. So, but we're, let's talk about uh, this in sort of a little bit of generality. Tangent vector V sub P to R cubed consists of two points, of two points of R cubed. Uh, one is the vector part. So vector part V and two is the point of application application P. So if you think about a tangent vector sitting on here, it sits on some point. And so that's going to be the point P and the vector is going to be, well, where it's going. So where it's pointing. Uh, and then of course you have a tangent space, um, tangent space, TP of R cubed is all tangent vectors to R cubed at P. And note that, of course, the tangent space in this particular case uh, is isomorphic thick to R3, but there is a different tangent space for each point. So they're not like they're isomorphic in structure, but of course you have a different one for each point. Uh, but different tangent space for each point. Now here we've talked about the tangent space for all of uh, well 3D Euclidean space. Now what we're much more interested in is the of course the tangent space to a manifold sitting in 3D space. So let's uh, define that. So if we let P be a point on our manifold contained in R cubed, uh, then a tangent vector, oh, a tangent vector layer of uh, VP to R cubed is uh, well tangent to m at p if p is the velocity of some curve curved in m at p uh, and then we can get a tangent plane a tangent plane uh, t p of m is the set of all such tangent vectors. Right, because if you have lists, you have a tangent vector here, but you also have a tangent vector layer and layer, et cetera. And so you get an entire plane of, well, that's not very solid, but you get the entire plane of uh, tangent vectors. Right. Okay, and uh, let's recall that uh, you can cover a two manifold with charts. So can cover a two manifold with uh, a number of charts, uh, which homeomorphically homeomorphically map a neighborhood of a point of a point to an open subspace, open subset of R2. Um, and the inverse of that map, um, inverse of that map uh, is a uh, R patches and can be used to parameterize these neighborhoods. Okay, so all we're saying there is that, well, if you have something like this, 
locally, it looks sort of like 2D because that's the whole point of having a 2D manifold. And then you can put together a bunch of these um, uh, thing, um, mappings, and then you can parameterize the spaces around uh, any uh, neighborhood. And importantly, uh, so let's see, this is theorem 5.1, which we're not going to prove. We're not going to prove very much today. It's mostly going to be setting up these things. Uh, so if you let P be uh, a point in on the manifold, and we're going to let phi be a patch, patch in M, such that phi of U naught B naught is equal to P. Okay, so it's a patch that includes uh, our point P. Um, a tangent vector, vector V to R cube at P is tangent to M, if and only if B is equal to C1 phi U of U naught B naught plus C2 phi B of U naught B naught. Okay, where these are the directional derivatives. So here we have two different directional derivatives. And something is a tangent vector if it's a linear combination of your two uh, directional derivatives. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, what's up? So, do you, what are, so path, uh, is it just a path? Like, uh, oh, sorry, uh, path, 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 patch. Oh. Yep, yeah, uh, yes, sorry, I wrote that wrong. But yeah, so, so it's, it's a, a mapping from some subset of R2 into uh, your manifold, uh, at least locally. Yeah, yes, so not path. Sorry. Catch. Uh, and plus uh, the tangent playing, tangent playing PP of M uh, is a subspace of the tangent space PP of R cubed. Which shouldn't be too surprising. You have some playing that's sitting in your uh, thing. Uh, but more importantly, and is the best linear approximation linear approximation of the surface M near P. Okay, so I have a drawing of it, but basically props are useful. Okay, uh, let's see. So now we can define vector fields and vector flows. So a lot of what we're doing right now is we're setting up basically calculus and manifolds. That's all we're doing right now. So if you've seen that before, Len, this is all, uh, this might be our review. Um, actually, how many of you guys have seen calculus and manifolds before? Okay, so uh, I will go through this relatively quickly, Len. Um, so, uh, okay, but uh, let's make sure that we talk about these. So a vector field or a flow, a flow, on M uh, is a function that assigns a vector, finds a vector VP in the tangent space uh, to each point, each point P in M, right? Because what you're doing is you're flowing along this manifold and uh, directions along this manifold are given by the, uh, the tangent space. And now that we have this, we can define a derivative. And derivatives are nice. So uh, importantly, this is a derivative as you move along the manifold, uh, not just derivative in three space. Um, so if we let BP uh, be in TP of M, uh, and we let H be from M to R, then the derivative, we're gonna call this BP H, uh, of h, uh, since h is some function, with respect to vp is the common value, value of d dt h of gamma of zero for all curves, uh, gamma in m with initial velocity vp. A uh, note that uh, we're we're doing this using the Euclidean metric. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons we need that. Question? Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. I thought you were raising your hand, yep. But yeah, so uh, all we've done is, so this is, 
basic generalization of the derivatives. Instead of moving in a particular direction in three space, you're moving along this manifold and then asking, uh, how does it change? And in order to do that, because uh, you have to basically say that it's the common value of all curves going through that point. Um, and with a little bit of work, you can show that this is a well-defined quantity. And that is the derivative of that. Um, and then once you have derivatives, you can define a differential. So the differential, uh, let's call this the H sub P uh, of H from M to R uh, at this point, uh, P in M is a linear function. D H sub P from T P of M to R such that D H P of V P is equal to V P of H. Okay, so the differential is just some machine that converts vector fields. So uh, vector fields on your manifold into real value functions. Uh, how much your uh, H function is changing as you go in that direction. Um, and so this is some linear map from directions um, and ve vector fields that on your manifold into these uh, real values. Definition 5.6. So now that we've done all this work to set up um, calculus on manifolds, well, we can make use of our standard uh, terminology for calculus and manifolds, including critical points. So a point P in M is critical. Well, what, what does it normally mean for a point to be a critical point? Uh, in ordinary calculus. Yeah, all the first partial derivatives vanish. Uh, if the H sub P is the zero map. And the, uh, for nice functions of all the first partial derivatives vanish, the entire derivative also vanishes, obviously. Um, so otherwise, P is regular. Okay, so this is to say, as you said, if basically all the partial derivatives uh, go to go to zero. Okay, so now we've generalized ordinary multivariable calculus to calculus on manifolds. Um, and as an ordinary calculus, we can additionally classify these critical points. Uh, so, and the way we do that is we look at the uh, Hessian matrix. So if we let uh, x, y be a patch on M at P, the Hessian uh, of a function h is just h of p is equal to uh, d squared h over dx squared of p uh, d squared. H. So these are all partial derivatives, obviously. So y del x of p, uh, del squared h, del x, del y of p, and del squared h, del y squared of p. Okay, and this is in terms of uh, in terms of the basis where we've chosen a particular directions del del x of p and del del y of p. Uh, yep, for t p m. Okay, and uh, once we have a Hessian matrix, we can define whether a critical point is degenerate or not. Um, so a critical point is degenerate point is, or let's say non-degenerate first. Um, P in M is non-degenerate generate if we know that the determinant of H of P is not equal to zero. And otherwise it is degenerate. How often is a critical point uh, degenerate? Looking at the space of all possible functions, how often do you get degenerate critical points? Let me ask a different question. How often are, is a matrix singular? A matrix is generally not very singular, right? So if you take a random matrix, the chances that it's going to be uh, for whatever, nearly any probability distribution you can define over matrices, you're probably not going to get a singular matrix. So somehow a generic matrix is non-singular. And we're also going to be, so a lot of what we're going to be talking about with 
uh, when we're defining a Morse function is we're going to be defining a particular function that is in some sense generic. So um, sometimes bad things can happen. Morse functions are what happens when bad things don't happen. Uh, and that's sort of what we're doing all the setup for. And so that allows us to now define a Morse function. So this is going to be definition 5.9, uh, a smooth map, map uh, H from M to R is a Morse function. Function if all its critical points, critical points are non degenerate. And sometimes in some textbooks, they'll require this, and sometimes they'll not. Sometimes they'll also require uh, distinct function values, uh, function values at critical points. Okay, so what are we saying? What we're saying is that uh, somehow most critical points for a generic function are going, I mean, critical points for a generic function are going to be non degenerate. And furthermore, it is a special event when two, uh, if you have a collection of a finite number of points of a function, it is a special event if two of them have the same value. Uh, and in the generic case, they won't have exactly the same value. Um, and so we're going to call this sort of, this a Morse function when it satisfies these two criteria that the critical points are non degenerate. And sometimes also that they have different values at those critical points. So obviously the first derivatives are all zero, but you may have some saddle point. Like if you look at something like this on here, um, actually I'm going to be doing this in a moment, but uh, you can sort of think about the different critical points, the saddle points, the uh, local mins and local maxes, and somehow those um, all need to have, all need to be distinct uh, for a generic function. Uh, importantly, the fact that your critical points are non-degenerate also means you can't have two critical points right next to each other. And this is quite important because um, you can think about uh, some weird functions where you have to have an entire line of saddle points or an entire line of minima, right? And those are not very, those are hard to work with because you can't count them. Um, and so we're only going to be working with functions where we can count the critical points. And somehow this uh, ability to count them is going to play a really important role. Um, and as an aside, everything we've stated generalizes to higher dimensions. You can define a Hessian matrix for higher dimensions. You can define everything for higher dimensions. Um, we're just not going to because it's hard to visualize and the notation gets a little bit complicated. Um, and importantly, uh, let's see, this is the uh, lemma 1.5. Uh, oh, sorry, 5.1. This is the Morse lemma. Um, and this says, uh, this is basically just talking about given a Morse function, you know that all the critical points are nice, right? And so if you stare and zoom close enough at each of these nice critical points, they're all going to have easily classifiable behavior. So uh, it is possible to choose local coordinates, uh, local coordinates x, y at a critical point p and m, such that uh, a Morse function, function H takes the form H of X, Y is equal to plus or minus X squared plus or minus Y squared. Okay, and basically you can think about this because if you look at the Hessian matrix, uh, this is equivalent to saying that um, the, uh, just counting the number of positive or negative eigenvalues of the uh, Hessian matrix. Um, and of course, in, for your Hessian matrix, um, we are guaranteed that you don't have any zero eigenvalues. Uh, and this generalizes if you have more than this, these variables, you have plus or minus x1 squared, plus or minus x2 squared, and so on for all your coordinates. Um, and in two dimensions, this uh, is a really easy classification. If h of xy is equal to x squared plus y squared, when p is a minimum, right? Uh, and if h of xy is equal to x squared minus y squared, or h of xy is equal to minus x squared plus y squared, uh, len, what is P? So, yeah, it's just the saddle point. It goes down along one side and goes up along the other. Sort of like if you look at this point here, it goes down one direction and goes up in the other direction going up to uh, is a saddle point. Uh, and lastly, of course, we also have a maxima. Minus X squared minus Y squared. Len P is a maximum. 
And this, uh, the implication of this is just what I just described that the critical points are isolated. Because if you look at, um, because if you look at zoom close enough to a critical point, it does either list, list, or whatever, it can't stay in place. And so you can't have two critical points right next to each other if you zoom in far enough. Far enough. Um, and now we can define this more generally. Uh, we can define something called the index of a critical point. The index uh, I of P of H at a critical point, critical point P in M is the number of negative eigenvalues, negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. Okay, so up here, well, the index of this minimum is equal to zero, the index here is equal to one, and the index here is equal to two. And so basically the index is telling you how many directions um, that you can go, uh, um, how many of the eigen directions can you can go where things go down versus where things go up. Um, and in higher dimensions, of course, you can have an index higher than two because you have more than two different uh, directions. Okay, so let's see, where am I? Now that we've defined this, we can try to understand these sort of lines that connect together critical points um, and the like sort of uh, flows that happen along these manifolds. And so we're gonna talk about uh, stable and unstable manifolds, which are sub-manifolds of our big manifold. Uh, so let's say, uh, what color do I want? Let's use purple. Stable and unstable manifolds. Um, this is gonna be definition 5.12. <clears throat> so, uh, well, let's look at the curve, uh, gamma. Let gamma be any curve passing through P, uh, through P tangent to BP uh, in the tangent plane. Now we're going to define gradient. So the gradient delta H of a Morse function H is going to be given by D gamma DT dot delta H is equal to D of H of gamma DT. Um, in general, you can replace this inner product with any Riemannian metric that you want, but we're going to stick with a normal Euclidean metric for simplicity. Um, and as a note, uh, the directional derivative, uh, given this definition, this matches with what you learned in your multivariable calculus class. The directional derivative uh, BP um, is equal to VP dot delta H of P, okay? So this is a um, gradient in the, the normal sense of gradient. I just slightly complicated because you have to define it, what it means to be a gradient on the manifold. Um, and uh, also if you choose your coordinates carefully, you choose your coordinates X and Y, so that tangent vectors, tangent vectors, uh, del del x of p and del del y of p are orthonormal. Uh, then that gives uh, the, nor the ordinary form, the form delta h is equal to uh, del h del x of p um, and del h del y of p. Okay. And so now the gradient of a Morse function is, a, is, of course, a vector field, because on any point on here, you can see which direction is the gradient pointing. Um, if I have the ordinary height function, well, it's always pointing in whichever direction gets you up, right? Um, and so now what we can do is, now we have this um, vector field on, uh, based on this gradient, based on this Morse function, uh, what we can do is you can use that to decompose the entire manifold into regions of uniform flow. So you can use the flow of this gradient to decompose the um, manifold into a bunch of cells. And this will give us a cellular complex, which is when, what then we're defining homology over, um, which we're probably not going to get to all of today, but uh, we'll see how far we get. Um, and the basic idea is we'll be following along these vector flows. So if you think back to differential equations of 244, 267, or B44, whichever one you took, um, uh, 
But you can we one of the things we discussed was, of course, you can integrate along um, some sort of vector field and see where a particle gets pushed, basically. And so that's what we're going to do. And uh, by existence and uniqueness, what you'll find is that, well, the paths that particles get pushed, well, those have to be distinct, right? And so then you can use those sorts of paths where particles get, put, get pushed along to decompose the entire space. Uh, uh, but first, we need to define everything and generalize everything to uh, the setting of manifolds. So uh, what is an integral line? Oh, whoa, that is the wrong color. Uh, an integral line. So basically, what does it mean to integrate along this vector field in your manifold? So an integral line uh, gamma from R to M uh, is a maximal pass, path, is a maximal path whose tangent vectors, vectors agree with the gradient. Something happened? Okay, with the gradient. Uh, that is to say that del del S of the path um, is equal to the gradient of H along the path for all S in R, okay? So you're pushing something along and you're just saying, well, you can think of this, uh, the coordinate S as time, as you push it along, where do you go? And then you push it on as far as you can uh, in both directions. Um, so where does it go to at in time infinity? What is the approach? And where does it come from at time negative infinity? Uh, and we call those, of course, just the origin. Uh, origin of gamma is equal to the limit as S goes to minus infinity of gamma of S and the destination uh, dest of gamma is equal to the limit as S goes to positive infinity of gamma of S. Um, and there are a couple of useful facts. Uh, one of which is that integral lines are open on both ends, on both ends, and the limits exist and are critical points. Okay, because uh, the critical points are exactly where the gradient is stationary, right? And so you can't ever actually reach your critical point, but like the gradient flow will eventually push you to some critical point or another. And you also would have started arbitrarily close to some critical point if you go back in time uh, as you evolve time backwards. And these integral lines have a number of nice properties. Uh, so uh, let's see, integral lines. Lines have properties uh the first one is that integral lines are either disjoint or the same are either disjoint or the same because we don't have any sense of inertia right so if two integral lines were to cross well then they have to evolving forward they clearly have to go to the same place and of course you can evolve things backwards and they also have to go to the same place uh, at least for nice functions uh, and so therefore uh, two integral lines are either disjoint or they have to be exactly the same uh, the other useful fact is integral lines cover all of M. This is easy enough to show. Well, you start at any point in M, and clearly you can integrate forward and you can integrate going backwards. Um, you may stay in place the entire time if you started at the critical point, but still, you cover all of M. And C, the limits. Oh, I already said this. The limits, uh, origin of P and destination of P uh, are critical points points of H. Okay, so these integral lines are just the paths following the gradient flow in the manifold. Uh, and now that we have this, we can define the, we can define the stable and unstable manifold uh, of, of a point. So the stable manifold, manifold. A stable manifold. Uh, which is going to be S of P is going to be the set, including the point P union with uh, all Y in our manifold, such that Y is in the image of gamma and the destination of gamma is equal to P. Okay, uh, these are manifolds of a critical point uh, for, the, for the record. Uh, I mean, you can define a stable manifold for a non-critical point, but you just end up with nothing, right? So, 
uh, and the unstable manifold, the unstable manifold, unstable manifold, uh, U of P is going to be again P union with Y in M such that Y is in the image of some gamma for some path gamma or some um, integral line gamma whose origin is equal to P. Uh, where of course, image has the usual meaning. Image of gamma is the image of the path of the path gamma from R to M. Okay, and so uh, if you look at something like this, uh, you can start at some point. Uh, let's say we start at this critical point up top. Okay, so if you start at this critical point up top, well, there are several different directions that you can go that, um, uh, well, uh, let's ask an easier question. What is the stable manifold of this critical point up here? So all the outside. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because um, again, what is the stable manifold? The stable manifold is all paths whose destination is uh, your point. Um, and so anything, uh, so I, I guess it also, oh, sorry, I should, should be a bit more clear. Um, let's say that we are going in the direction of positive gradient. Uh, sometimes you see people going in that direction of negative gradient. But yeah, so if you're going in the direction of positive gradient, and this includes everything on the, the outsides that goes up to this point. But there are a couple of exceptions, right? So suppose that you started right down here along this inside. If you started along here on the inside, uh, exactly along the inside, then what you do is you go up to here, but you'll never actually cross over onto the other side. And so, the, the, are, so somehow this includes like most of the outside. So that you have a two dimensional stable manifold, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't include all of the surface because there are special like directions on here that it doesn't include. Uh, whereas if you uh, started, say, here uh, on this saddle point here, right? So you have a saddle point here. Uh, what dimension is its stable manifold? So what are all the points that go to this point? Yeah, because it's all the things along this inside here that go to it, but then don't ever stray off because it strays off and it'll end up going up here. Um, what about its unstable manifold? No, the unstable manifold is also just the line that's going from this point up to the top because it, the origin has to be this point. And so most points never, their paths never go to, uh, sorry, the saddle point there. And so somehow you have an unstable, man, uh, sorry, a stable manifold going around here, but not including the very bottom point, of course, because the very bottom, um, the very bottom point uh, um, is a critical point itself. Um, and you have another um, manifold that uh, the unstable manifold that sort of goes along the outside of the screen. Um, and importantly, uh, actually, that's actually a pretty good place to stop. And I'll come back to this again tomorrow. But the basic idea is that if you look at all the stable manifolds, well, clearly, if you look at all the critical points, the stable manifolds of all the critical points have to include all of the uh, manifold, right? Because everything on the manifold goes to some critical point. And so the, uh, you can decompose the entire manifold into a bunch of open cells, uh, where an open cell is uh, one, of these, um, op one of these stable manifolds uh, which you go to. And there's also a nice duality of decomposing everything into the unstable manifolds. And the, there are some nice relations of like the dimensions and the sort of dualness of the two different decompositions. And those are the building blocks we'll be using tomorrow to uh, well, show that uh, you can actually generate, um, you, that you can use this decomposition to generate a filtration and compute uh, homologies. Okay, I think that's it for today. So uh, any questions or? Uh, so that has to do with the compactness of um, your, so remember we assumed that the manifold was compact. Uh, because you're following a vector field, right? So uh, you can't go, you can't go in a circle because at every point your your gradient is increasing some function, right? So if you're follow, so if, uh, in this particular case, we have some function of the gradient. Let's say in this case, we're using the height function. Um, every time I move a step, I need to be increasing that height function. 
Yeah. And so that prevents you from having weird circular behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So this basically has to do with the niceness of the function that we chose to begin with. Uh, and the fact that we're using a gradient field of this nice function. Um, all sorts of things can go wrong when you have not nice functions or you have non-compact manifolds, um, but we're not going to deal with that. Okay, uh, having said that, email me when you want to present. Uh, class is dismissed. <laughs>